Welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone being here today. The One State Conference is uh, happily going online and this virtual event is a bit of a sea change, but I think we've had a lot of sea changes in the last six to eight months. It's, a, it's certainly a unique time for us. Uh, and aren't we all grateful that technology has advanced in such a manner that we can have a conference online and continue uh, networking and communicating and sharing and supporting. This session is support and amplify the role of community art centers during the time of pandemic. Uh, and it's a funny thing when we think about what is our community because like the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, we're all made up of a large variety of communities, each with uh, their commonalities and their very strange differences. And it's our opportunity as uh, cultural agents to help support those communities, uh, help them find their voice and to find our own voices in making the arts something that is uh, viable and live. There are those that would want to say that the arts are a safe space, but all of us who are practitioners in the arts know that uh, safety always is uh, secondary to risk and embracing risk and challenge and having courage is central to all of our missions. Um, oddly, it's a time where so many great arts organizations are under tremendous amounts of stress with lack of audience and fighting for uh, funding and finding for voice. But we're going to hear from a number of uh, arts center organizers, arts leaders from across the state in this session. And we'll be talking about how we have sought to meet that challenge and to make the arts uh, important and vital and ultimately indispensable for our communities. So, Please uh, join us as we begin this discussion. Yeah, I guess I'm unmuted. Hi, everyone. Thanks and welcome. My name is Liz Chilson, and I am the director of the Flex Space at the Riverside Arts Center. And I'm really thrilled to be here today. I really, um, I want to first of all say thanks to Doug and to the Local Arts Network for sponsoring this talk. And thanks also to the Arts Alliance for this. I'm so excited about this conference coming up. It's, it's just so many good things to do. And also, I really appreciate the support and uh, uh, in every way for this, for this panel. It's a, a topic that is very near and dear to my interests. I'm really excited about the conversation. And I want to just say a few words to introduce the panel and introduce, introduce some of the ideas. Um, I want to encourage everyone who is uh, with us today to please use the chat and the Q uh, and A that you'll find on the bottom of your screen to please send us um, comments, questions, ideas. A big goal of this panel today is to have a conversation, hopefully start a conversation and really figure out a way that we might actually really amp up the um, support that we give one another across the state. Uh, this is a, a such a challenging time and um, there's so much to do. So um, we put together this panel today of a really uh, wide range of experience and interests and um, we have urban and rural, small town and large uh, communities, centers that serve large and small organizations, uh, long-standing organizations and ones that are quite new. Uh, we have a mix of age, race, and gender, and a broad experience um, with ideas and solutions around pandemic response, and also equity, diversity, and social, the social challenges that we face today. So I'm really excited to get to that. I'm going to do just a very, very brief introduction of each of the panelists that we have with us today so that we can spend most of our time listening, hearing their uh, uh, presentations and then having you all, having us a, a time to address your comments and questions. So, um, so as I said, an important goal for this panel is for us to share experiences and insights and generate ideas, hopefully to support one another's work across the state. And the central question for me really is, and the central question that I've asked the panelists to look at is, how can we support and amplify one another's work, especially in this cacophonous environment of need in which we find ourselves? 
And um, Latanya, are you able to put up the first slide, the, um, the, the one state intro slide set there? If not, I can do it from here, but um, my computer wasn't happy with that the other day. Um, let's see, maybe I should just do it. Oh, there we go. There we go. So, um, and can you back it up to the first page? There we go. This is it. So our first panelist is Betsy Dollar and she is the representative of the Springfield Arts Association, which is a longstanding, well-established institution with, that was founded in 1913, has a really broad mission and a lot of facets or eight areas of focus, including a historic site. And Betsy's been there for 11 years, so she has a good, solid experience there. Following Betsy will be Sierra McKissick, who is representing two organizations, AMFM, which is an organization she founded in 2009 to support emerging artists and create an atmosphere of positivity and a culture of inclusion. Um, Sierra, Sierra also coordinates public programs at the Hyde Park Arts Center which is where I met her first. And the Hyde Park Arts Center is a longstanding community arts center with deep connections in Hyde Park, specifically in the neighborhood, but also throughout Chicagoland and uh, internationally with some international programs. Then following Sierra will be Doug, who you've met, and he is from the McLean County Arts Center. And McLean County is the largest county in the state, if you count the land area. Cook County is bigger, but if you take away the lake, McLean County is bigger. And so he has, he's based in Bloomington, but he represents this really, and serves this really broad community that includes small town and rural areas. And then following Doug is uh, John Veal, whose work at um, Altspace is hyper-local. And Altspace is the newest organization that we have on the panel today. It was founded three years ago by John and his collaborator, Jordan, Jordan Campbell. And they are deeply committed to working with the communities on the west side and south side of Chicago. Uh, and so without any further um, time, I wanna just say, please, please do use the Q&A and the chat. Please um, send us your ideas. And, uh, and really, I'd like to just repeat from the introduction to this panel, how can local arts centers cement relationships within communities continuing to support artists, offering local-based programming, and also provide opportunities for engagement with the larger issues that the, I think the pandemic has really kind of em emphasized how connected we all really are across the globe. And so these larger questions of equity and social justice and um, how to handle the pandemic and um, all of the other things, of climate change and things like that. So um, thanks so much. And I am uh, happy, to look at, happy to turn this over to Betsy. Hi, everybody. I don't know if cameras are switching. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, all right, cool. That's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, Springfield is your state capital, and it's kind of a large, small town in the way that it operates. There are a lot of influences from outside of the town, but the Springfield Art Association has been around a long time, and its mission really is to, as a um, education center. Uh, our School of Art, which deals with students from age four to about 94 at this point, um, we offer classes in 13 different media and we have about 40 different uh, teachers who uh, teach in our eight different studios. So the school is kind of the core of what we do. We have two different galleries. One is, uh, again, more of an educational gallery that rotates uh, exhibitions monthly that includes everything from like the watercolor and pastel societies and the Central Illinois Scholastic Competition to 
um, national jury shows and solo exhibitions. I curate about five of those shows um, a year. And then we have a sales gallery, which represents 72 local artists in a separate location here in town. We have a dedicated visual arts library. We have a, an artist in residence program. Um, we have five big fundraising events every year and it feels like several little ones every you know month because that's what we do we raise money to be able to make art and um yeah so that's kind of the overview of uh, how we reach out um yeah the pandemic um Technically, this is our second pandemic since we were here in 1918, but the founding mothers didn't leave us a lot of messages about how that impacted them um, back in the day. So that wasn't terribly helpful. But um, yeah, we kind of went back to what we do best and kept it really simple. We reached out, um, first with a May basket campaign so that we encouraged people to be making things at home, making baskets at home with things that they had at home to share with their neighbors and um, get, you know, it's, it's the perfect social distance thing because you're just supposed to leave it on your neighbor's porch. You don't have to interact with them in any way, shape, manner or form. and. Then we moved into something called Chalk It Up, which we did with a local radio station um, where we handed out free sidewalk chalk and actually did a competition um, with people sending in what they did on their sidewalks and their driveways um, at home. And um, this was at the same time that we were refunding an entire semester of classes so that was a little bit painful it's like well it doesn't look like we're doing a spring semester then we refunded all the summer art camp money that was a little painful but we did manage to regroup with putting art camp in place for six weeks in um very small classes. We actually introduced lamp working. That's what you see on the screen right now. Um, Latanya, you can just sort of click through all of these camp images of kids wearing masks and making art. Um, we kept the classes super small. We went through gallons of hand sanitizer. Um, the kids were magnificent about wearing their masks. They each, each group had a separate door. They had a separate play area. We managed to get through six weeks of uh, 62 different camps with um, about 570 kids over that period of time with no viruses. So um, that was a huge win. Um, and I have to say, you know, the family self-selected in or out, um, you know, as to whether they wanted to participate. And the summer faculty was terrific about really keeping kids safe and separated. And, um, but they all had a great time and made some really fun stuff. The image you see right now was the first place winner for Chalk It Up. Um, it's on someone's driveway and it's awesome because it looks like a kid climbing this, the ladder in a library. So, um, so that uh, the next, you can just scroll through the Chalk It Up images. Um, so it looked like people had a lot of fun with that. Um, our summer fundraising event is something called Paint the Street, which we couldn't do, but we turned it into Paint the Driveway and uh, got 300 different uh, buckets out there into the community. And basically, instead of turning a single street into a, a gallery, we turned the entire uh, city into a gallery. This image is something from also in place of camp, we created things called Make Kits. And for $15, we have 19 different art projects that come in a box. And we have three cooking projects that come in a box and uh, three history-based projects that um, come in a box. And we have, to this date, sold um, 1,212 of those boxes. Um, we are quite sure that 
those will have a life beyond COVID. But for all those families who chose not to do summer art camp, they um, bought the boxes and made art at home. So our whole mission was to keep people creative, engaged, and giving them the tools to make things at home and stay active. Um, and they've been, you know, they've been very successful in that regard. And um, we're really happy that people are making things at home. Um, the, the sort of tagline was, uh, you know, make it at home until you can make it here. Here's, here are some of the May baskets that uh, we made as samples. Um, so yeah, the idea is to keep, keep people thinking creatively. And honestly, with art camp, the adults were so jealous because we didn't offer up any adult classes. Um, we are now about to launch fall classes, both for kids and adults, um, in the same format, hoping that we can keep everybody safe and engaged. And um, how am I doing on time? I think you're uh, at about six, uh, six and a half minutes. Okay, so I should probably stop. <laughs> if you're if you're ready. Um, I, I'm just going to say that, you know, we do a lot of public art things that you're, you're seeing paint the driveway here. Um, we are, we have a public art camp every summer that did a Route 66 mural this year that has um, gotten a lot of um, attention. Honestly, the newspapers are so desperate for content. They're over here all the time, you know, documenting what we're doing because we are engaging people and uh, we have two more big public art projects coming up through the course of the next year. So we're continually feeding art back into the community with both professional artists and our students. So we're trying to keep people um, engaged that way. Thanks, Betsy. I, um, when you mentioned public art, that's something that I'm really thinking a lot about because I think that the, the the possibility of interacting and not having to worry, or, you know, having the ability to not have to worry so much about how close we are and, you know, we can be outside, it feels safer. And it also feels really exciting. And it was fun to listen to Mel Chin's um, conversation also in the, in the, um, the keynote about the uh, public project he's working on. So thank you. Um, Sierra? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Sierra Lise McKissick. And as Liz said, I do two roles and wear two hats. So I am the public programs coordinator at the Hyde Park Arts Center. I will have been there for a year in October. And I'm also the founder of AMFM, an arts platform for emerging artists. Um, we do web uh, content and also events as well and uh, curated kind of interactions with different community spaces. But yeah, being at the Hyde Park Arts Center, we really do have a lot of different capacities for things that we do. Most of the work that we do stems from our exhibitions, our residency department, um, work with our teens as well, and our education and public programs as well. And me being there for just short under a year, my first uh, built in amount of the time there was really planning to present the public programs and then I was actually executing them during quarantine. So it's been an interesting time uh, working in a space, but I think that we've adapted really well um, to those changes and the workspace that we work in. So some things that have shifted in that time, um, we did have some major exhibitions planned. Um, currently our Artists Run Chicago show, which is up currently. And then we did have a major show with Fahim Majid that did have to get postponed to about a year later and some of our teen programs as well. So aside from not being able to be in the building and communally engage with all of the different facets of people that come to this space, um, what the Hyde Park Art Center is really known for is the fact that it's intergenerational. We do have, you know, as I said, teens who come and work in this space and doing professional development and leadership on our youth art board. They're very, very vocal. They've been involved in a lot of the organizing that's currently happening around institutions as well. We have um, artful aging programs for older adults where they're able to come in and do art making activities, things like movie nights and connect with people their age as well. And then we do have um, our educational classes 
that are taught by teaching artists. So um, with those courses, people are able to take different classes anywhere from photography to screen printing. Uh, ceramics is a really large component of the work that we do there. And then we have our residency program, which really fosters the development of emerging and established artists in the city of Chicago and also internationally, as Liz mentioned. Uh, we do have our creative wing, which um, supports two Chicago-based artists who are at the space for a year and are able to have a studio there, have a studio practice, and really engage with the community through different programs. And then we do have a visiting artist program where we have international artists come and stay with us for a period of time and also engage through that with their work as well. So with all of those things, a lot of it is very community engagement and driven by the people. So we were trying to figure out as a staff how we can continue to take those things with us into the virtual realm and space. And I think a lot of the things that we've noticed um, as we've shifted things is we're able to become more accessible to different people. So what we've done with our education department not being able to hold in-person classes is we've been doing virtual courses as well. And we've shifted from a tuition-based uh, model to a model for community supported programs. So people are able to essentially pay what they would like to um, to take the class. It kind of removes some of those barriers to entry and creates a more equitable and accessible space um, for people who might not have been able to attend before. I and mean, then as we're looking here, we were uh, able to softly reopen um, in the last couple of weeks to really push forward this Artist Run Chicago exhibition that features 50 artist run spaces from all across the city. And um, specifically, this show is supposed to be really grand. If you have 50 spaces, imagine the type of big opening or party we would have had. Essentially, all of the spaces took over the entire building and have small mini exhibitions in every space from the bathroom to like the gallery walls and the hallways um, in the space. So what we've done with that is we've opened only for appointment for people to be able to come and do the show. Um, on any given day and have about an hour and a half to walk through the exhibition. And we have a very robust online virtual programs um, calendar that I've curated myself uh, featuring these different spaces on Thursday nights um, between six and eight. You can come and see a performance from one of the artist spaces or a panel or talk um, from some of the participants. So that will be going through the run of the entire exhibition. And then some of the images that you're seeing here um, are from our art making activities. Something that I instituted before we went into the pandemic was Center Sundays. And it was the idea to bring together all of the different programs and um, different kind of things that we do at the Art Center, all the different departments, and have it be one day on the first Sunday of the month where people could come to the art space and either do an art making activity hear a talk or a performance from one of our resident artists or um, engage in any type of community supported uh, engagement activity as well. And with that framework being built, we did hold our first one in person in March, but after that things shortly closed, but it was a nice framework to set up so that we were able to still engage with people virtually and kind of use that as a model. So here is one of our resident artists in the past picture that we were just looking at, um, doing a artist talk live on Zoom and people were able to engage with her, ask questions. Um, we had art making activities where we had a teaching artist create a video that we would then upload to YouTube and people would be able to follow along with whatever activity they were doing for that time. And it's really something that we were able to do month by month. And something that we really learned and taken advantage of during this time is the idea of re-engaging people. People, when you're doing an in-person event, can only come during that place and that time and experience something. But with Zoom and all of these things, it's great that you can record content and then upload it to YouTube later for people to kind of tune in when they're able to or piece together. We've been making playlists for all of the Center Sundays activities so people can do them any month at any given time. And we've seen a lot of the numbers increase on our views on that stuff. And also being able to transcend geography has been something 
that's been really, really great. On this next Center Sundays, which is on October 4th, um, we're actually talking about global art initiatives and having conversations with artists from Malaysia and having convers conversations and performances with artists in the Netherlands as well and some Chicago-based artists. So really this kind of cross communication has been really great. And we're taking that into other aspects of our work as well. Um, specifically for our upcoming gala, which is our first virtual gala that we're gonna be doing. That'll be on November 21st. And that is also the first time that we're doing um, community supported model for that as well too. And it's been really great to be able to bring down some of those barriers and people who aren't necessarily able to attend that event in person. And we'll be able to engage with alumni that we previously worked with, they can come and attend or also present work for that. And that's just on the HPAC side of things. And I'll just talk very, very quickly about my work with AMFM. Um, I am the founder of that. It's a project I started back in college in 2009, but really it was born out of wanting to see emerging artists get a platform. So we do Q and A's and articles written up on our website with these artists as well. And a large component of the work was the in-person event, um, working with musicians and concerts and um, performances and connecting with the other institutions and organizations to present work for them as well. And we've had really great partnerships from the Museum of Contemporary Art to the School of the Art Institute, um, the Allied Media Conference in Detroit and Saatchi. Um, and we do host a festival every year called Feast, which we weren't able to do this year, but we also still, especially during this time where there's so much um, conversations around the climate um, with the protests and lack of food and scarcity, we've been continuing that conversation as well. And some of these images are just from some of the events that we've had in person. I really focus on artists of color to try to give their their voices a platform and be able to amplify those things to the public as well. And really, I think that working for the Hyde Park Art Center, I've learned a lot about what kind of values that we share. Really, it's about community engagement and an overlapping of communities and trying to bring all of those different things together. Uh, we did some outdoor exhibitions that you can see from the windows. And um, we also are supporting organizations that are supporting Black Lives Matter and organizing efforts um, through the donations that we've gotten from selling work as well. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Latanya. I mean, uh, Sierra, sorry, and thank you, Latanya, for, <laughs> for advancing the slides. Um, uh, and Doug, if you're, you're up next, if you're ready. All right, so uh, the McLean County Arts Center is one of the oldest community-based arts organizations in the Midwest. We can actually date our history back to 1888. Uh, we've been at our current facility since the early 70s. There's a lot of organizations, a lot of communities established arts agencies around the time of the bicentennial with the creation of the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, so it's, uh, we have 16 exhibitions per year in two gallery spaces. Let me open up uh, my shared screen. And we, um, so we have 16 exhibitions per year in two gallery spaces. And uh, we own our own building. It's an architecturally significant building designed by Arthur Lowe Pillsbury, who was a local architect, one of the few architects in the, the, around the state in the last turn of the century who had an Ivy League education. Uh, so we love our building. It's 105 plus years old and we hate our building. Um, but it, it makes for a wonderful space for, for the arts. Uh, we are the 501c3 nonprofit arts agency for McLean County. And as we said earlier, it's the largest geographic county in the state. So we're dealing with a lot of mixed populace. Uh, while we have State Farm Insurance headquarters in Illinois Western University and Illinois State University um, and a couple other smaller colleges, uh, it's, it's an intellectually sophisticated community, um, but we also have a vast uh, rural population and so trying to, to program to those different audiences becomes just one of the constant points of discussion that we have. So 16 exhibitions per year that includes what we think is the oldest amateur show continuously uh, offered amateur show in the state of Illinois and then every three years we have an exhibition of emerging Illinois artists which is a competition of, of 
uh, Masters of Fine Arts candidates from universities in the state of Illinois. Um, and the winner of that would have a, uh, a solo show in the next three years when that show is, is repeated. We offer 70 classes per year, and we have everything from ceramics, painting, drawing, printmaking, and those are all on site. Uh, we do two large community arts festivals, the Sugar Creek Arts Festival, which is every July, and the Spring Bloom Arts Festival, which is every March. Uh, both of those were canceled in the live this year. The Spring Bloom was canceled outright, and the Sugar Creek was presented virtually, which uh, was an interesting undertaking, but I think rather successful. And we serve as the regranting agency for the Illinois Arts Council Agency, and as a result, uh, I lead a group of local arts programmers for what is called the Area Arts Roundtable, a consortium of, of those arts programmers, uh, to share resources and to communicate best practices, which is, in a larger way, what the Local Arts Network does. And the Local Arts Network is that consortium of arts agencies, uh, leaders from around the state that work and share resources and indeed the, the land the local arts network is uh, one of the sponsors of these sessions uh, because this is is really central to the the mission of the land and the land is co-sponsored by arts alliance illinois and the Illinois arts council agency so uh, we have actually gone ahead and returned to classes we've moved most of our classroom space upstairs into our main gallery because it allows for social distancing. As you can see in this picture, everyone's wearing masks. We do temperature checks and we have uh, uh, a lot of hand sanitizer. That seems to have worked out well. Um, we have had uh, some spikes of COVID within the community. Uh, we've been very fortunate here as it hasn't impacted us directly, but we're taking every precaution. Our gallery space is actually open too. Uh, and we just limit the number of people that are available to come in and see the shows and of course require social distancing and, and masks and temperature checks and, and that's worked out fine for us. So uh, typically we have a lot of different exhibitions within our spaces uh, and musical performances and we had a monthly story slam uh, event where we partnered with the local NPR station for those stories to be broadcast and then podcasted. Uh, and so a lot of that stuff has fallen by the wayside. Uh, but we continue with our artist-led classes to uh, make sure we can offer things to the community. Now, when the pandemic first hit and everyone was homebound and parents were trying to come up with activities for the kids, we introduced a daily art activity, which uh, on a bad day was a coloring page, uh, which proved to be kind of popular. But uh, we offered uh, sculptures and uh, all sorts of projects that really kept everyone engaged. And if you visit the Art Center's Facebook page, uh, you can see that we, we have uh, uh, many, many days. I think we, we did close to 80, 90 days of that where we had uh, people submitting their, their uh, art project on a daily basis and we partnered with some local restaurants, uh, pizza places, so that we would have winners that could get prizes as a way to to have everyone get engaged. Uh, additionally, uh, I did offer a free watercolor painting class, um, which we just set up on, on uh, Facebook and YouTube to be broadcast out and people would submit their, their finished projects for that. And that uh, was really time consuming, but proved to be uh, very successful for the community. Um, we continue with arts advocacy and uh, during normal times, uh, I've been very involved with going to Washington, D.C. or Springfield in order to advocate on behalf of the arts, uh, working with Arts Alliance Illinois, and that continues. And I think that uh, there's no crisis that shouldn't be utilized to uh, promote our messages. And actually, uh, we have so much that's occurring right now with really a, a landscape change in how businesses function and how uh, uh, commerce is functioning that uh, the arts can play a pivotal role. And to that end, I, I spent uh, part of yesterday and part of today in, in phone calls with uh, city managers and uh, town councilmen uh, and women as, as we look at uh, what art opportunities 
would be available. Uh, in particular, in, in this case, in, in uh, Bloomington, as uh, there's been a, a landscape change with, with how businesses function, and it's our hope that we'll be able to utilize that to promote public art in a, in a very profound way. Um, you know, when we look at, at uh, the commerce of malls, uh, which has lost a lot of its, its traction due to the internet, that, that reintroduces uh, a whole different attention to downtown areas. And it's our hope that working collaboratively with municipal entities and other art presenters, that we can uh, introduce public art in a way that um, profoundly impacts the community and helps support those artists as well. So um, I said earlier, our summer arts festival, which uh, Sugar Creek Arts Festival, which is usually the second weekend in July, uh, we get 130 artists for that event and we get 20,000 people over the course of two days. Uh, this year, we canceled that, which was a major revenue stream for us, but we reintroduced for the artists at a very reduced rate, an online festival which gave those artists the opportunity to have their own virtual uh, booth, really a website. And uh, we would manage that and allow uh, them to, to connect with some of our old purchasers. Many artists didn't have websites, so uh, we were able to help facilitate that. And we had live music for that as well. If you enjoyed uh, Edward David Anderson's performance earlier, uh, we have a 45 minute concert from him uh, that was part of our festival that's still available to search. So Doug, I just want to, um, so I just got a note that we have five minutes for our Q and A, so oh. before our Q and A. So I wanted to just see um, if uh, you're ready to, for us to ha ask John to present. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, please. That's okay. Please. Thank you. No, it's all good, bro. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I think uh, having 10 minutes for, such amazing artists and, and organizations to present is really tight. You know what I mean? It's, it's really, it's, it's tough. And so um, thank you so much for the history and all the ways in which you advocate within your community. Um, same with you, Betsy. And, um, you know, I've been a big fan, um, you know, an admirer of Sierra's for a very long time now. You know, AMFM does incredible work, uh, High Park Art Center as well. And, and me and Liz, um, for those who don't know, uh, we were on the same cohort with um, Chicago Artist Coalition, you know what I mean, um, as artists in residence. And so I just wanted to uh, take time. I think that we, I mean, we can be so focused on business, you know what I mean, so focused on timelines um, that we don't connect with the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter today is about supporting one another and loving one another. Because um, we are 77 communities in Chicago, we are one Chicago. And so with that being said, I'm gonna present what I do. Um, so for those who don't know me, um, oh, yikes, that's not it. <laughs> um, for those who don't know me, my name is John Vio. I am the co-founder of Alt Space, um, Alt Space Chicago, and uh, we are a contagious artist-led engine that undertakes tangible acts of service, um, using art and faith as tools that galvanize impassioned, self-sufficient communities to join in at a time when past and present injustices spur us to collectively imagine our best futures. And so what we really do is we revitalize communities using art and culture. Um, here's a little bit about our roots, you know, so um, to your left, you'll see a brick. This brick is located on Laramie and um, uh, Service Boulevard um, in Austin. And, you know, it's, it's funny, man, when people think Austin, they typically think Texas, you know, and uh, Austin, though, is the largest community in Chicago. You know, I mean, it's the west side, and that's where I'm from, you know, and this brick uh, that says Mercedes Douglas commemorates my grandmother, who um, was a service to the community and one of the founding members of CAPS and, you know, uh, spent her entire life serving the west side. Um, and to the right, you'll see the wall of respect. You know, I think Chicago, we have a deep history of art being able to lead the way and galvanize communities and being able to represent who we are together. And that makes me think about like the communal weaver birds, you know, located in West Africa that actually build their nests together and they support one another. And that's how I think Chicago supports one another. And so um, I'm an artist um, and my business partner, Jordan Campbell, he's an incredible artist and photographer. Um, 
And if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it, you know, and understanding that we are, we are faith-based. What we do is what we believe we are called to do. Um, and so a little bit about community. Um, we, approach com we approach every project from a needs-based analysis perspective, re researching city data and talking to neighbors on an individual level so we can get a clear perspective on both the problems and the things the community wants to see. And so how we think about community, first and foremost, is that it's, it's more than just a zip code, right? It's, it's more than just like who you live by. It's a set of values that we all share. You know, and with understanding that we, we, we share these values, we rethink assets. And a lot of times that's rethinking how we use buildings and how we use public space. Because how we treat buildings is how we treat people. And we, and we do this with collaboration, understanding it's not just about us, right? It's about all of us. And, and, and this space is for the use of everyone. Um, and that democratizes beauty. And so um, this is a good example of that. I'm just gonna talk briefly about this. Is, Project Stamp is where we got started, you know, last year. Uh, you can't just go into community and start changing things around without like um, being disrespectful at a point. So to be respectful of our neighbors, you know, we wanted to bring everyone together during like this block party moment, you know what I'm saying? And so within three days, we took as many pictures as we could at uh, Garfield Park Refectory, at the Goat Farm, you know, at Hubbard Park and being able to honor our neighbors because we wanted to use these images on abandoned spaces and so when you walk past an abandoned space in Austin, instead of seeing abandonment, you'd see your friends, you'd see your neighbors, you see auntie and uncle, you know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's what it's really about. Um, and so this is a good example of that. You know, we collaborate with other Chicago artists and, and being able to revitalize these old spaces. Um, so during the pandemic, um, we were, and we're, we've been in collaboration with Chicago Park District, teaching about art, artistic literacy and how to design your environment. Um, and we were going to create benches in Austin together, you know, because I think that's one of the things Austin was lacking is benches and garbage bins. And so we were teaching and, and, and gaining momentum. Then all of a sudden, all of our plans had to change, you know, with COVID-19, what are we going to do? And so we decided, let's just use it as, an, as a way for them to tell their stories. You know, a lot of our, our students were seniors. You know, they didn't get to go to senior prom. You know, a lot of our students um, didn't have a way to share their voice during all of this, this pandemic nonsense, you know. And so we use it as an opportunity to have a, a photography class, you know, because everyone had a camera on their phone. And so being able to teach artistic literacy and being able to work with uh, 60 Inches from Center and Tempest Hazel, um, who published their works, you know, I'm really grateful for that partnership. Um, these are some of the, the challenges in which we face underutilized spaces, deforestation, unemployment, police brutality, coronavirus, food deserts, and, and Black Lives Matter. Um, I think it's important to say that, you know, George Floyd was murdered. Breonna Taylor was murdered. Like, <laughs> like and, then, and then like the world stopped. And as hard as it was for normal people, you know what I mean, just normal downtown living in the loop, to get toilet paper. It was even harder in Austin. It was even harder in Inglewood. It was even harder where, where your Costco is the dollar store, you know? And so we had to respond. You know, we don't react out of emotion, but we, we, we take time and we respond because that's, that's what we're called to do. All of us as, arts, um, as artists and as collaborators within community, we are beholden to the communities in which we serve. And so we use it as an opportunity um, to distribute 650 care packages within a single day. We raised a thousand dollars on social media, you know, just realizing that our, our communities needed help. We needed food, you know, we needed diapers, we needed uh, uh, toilet paper, you know, uh, but that wasn't enough for us, you know, to be able to have this one day of giving. Um, we need to break these systems of dependency. This is a really good moment to examine about what is a food desert and how can cre we create a, a, a tangible economy. And so this is how we created um, Alt Space Market. So Alt Space Market is a functional art installation that transforms abandoned spaces into a communal free market where members of the community can give and take, thus creating a temporary communal shared economy. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm only going to touch on it, but um, these are the last images I'll share for the, sh for the sake of time. But I think it's important to understand that to the far left, the image you'll see on the top is what the abandoned space looked like at first, you know, in Austin. 
and then below it, that's that's what we did, you know, with just five hours and a couple of friends, you know, we, we installed solar lights, we brought in food and, and watching community members not only come and pray over the space and be encouraged and, and give to the space as well, but to see them maintain it. You know, what maintains these spaces is our partnerships, our par partnership with Compound Yellow, our partnership with Grocery Run Chicago, Maintain Austin. For Greater Grand Crossing, Rebuild Foundation reached out to us and we built it with the community. Um, and then Inglewood Arts Collective and Rage helped maintain the, the Inglewood market. Um, all pillars in the community. I'll share one more thing is that, the, I'm sorry, is this slide right here. Um, we use it as an opportunity for workforce development. Understanding that through COVID-19, um, we, we, we still have to develop within our own communities, you know, and being able to understand art as a way to design our, our environments and change the, change the way of life. And so um, I say all this to say, we face a challenging time right now, all of us. But this time that we're in presents an incredible opportunity. And this opportunity is a, a, a way in which we can change the world. That's what we are meant to do as artists. We are meant to be the light to this darkness. You know, and through this darkness, we've all been able to come together as a community and show the world who we really are and what we expect from other institutions, right? Like this right here is protecting and, and service. This is real protect and service. You know, it's funny, uh, on, on, set, on, on 66 in Halsted, police actually ran into um, the, the Inglewood market and uh, they didn't know what it was. And so their instinct was to protect that market. You know what I'm saying? Be like, okay, we gotta protect this because they saw value. Um, and then it was neighbors and community members who came out and said, no, 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 no. Everything on these shelves is for free. Um, and so through um, our partnership with Chicago Park District, through our partnership with um, these other organizations providing the alt space market, we have kind of taken a stand to um, always be there for our community and to always be willing to install and make changes depending on who who we need to serve and so that's a little bit about alt space chicago thank you john and thanks everyone uh for your presentations this is really very inspiring john there's a lot of really beautiful things in the chat about um the work that you're doing and um, I, uh, in the interest of time, it's a few minutes after three and we have until 3.15 and I really do want us to get to the conversation about um, some of the ways that we can support one another and I wanted to just ask, I think there's a question that came to my mind because so many of us are doing, which at the Riverside Arts Center where I work, we've taken things online and we're doing a lot of things with um, uh, you know, trying to teach classes online and do all those things. And I remember when the Hyde Park Art Center was first sort of gearing up, I've taken classes there and been in a few programs. And it seemed like the Hyde Park Art Center did some training for artists. And I wonder, I don't know, Sierra, if you know about that, but how do we, you know, are there a lot of people I know, a lot of artists are kind of like, I don't deal with technology unless you like make films or do photography or something like that. A lot of people aren't really comfortable in the technology area. And, um, and so I just wonder, is there a way that we can help people get up to speed with technology? I mean, it's a very kind of nuts and bolts question, but does anyone have any thoughts or things that you've done at your institutions to address that? Yeah, I know specifically for the Hyde Park Art Center, before we even started to do um, things on Zoom or virtual programs, we had a staff training together so that we could all be comfortable with Zoom and the different platforms that were being used for virtual programs. And then, as you mentioned before, we then took that to our teaching artists and had a teaching artist kind of gathering where they were able to learn how to operate and use Zoom and do screen share and engage with people on those different channels and whatnot as well, too. And then even for our exhibition to be open, currently, we had a large conversation about what would be the best way to do contract tracing to gather enough information about people um, their email, their name, and be able to time specifically out things and Eventbrite ended up being the best bet um, for that across the board. So um, we've definitely uh, worked as a team to try to forge forward and push forward how we um, plan to execute things. 
sorry, my mute. Um, so there are a few questions in the, um, I think there's some sort of nuts and bolts questions for you uh, at the Hyde Park Art Center about how, how do people participate in the workshops virtually? Do they follow along on YouTube? And I know there are some, uh, you know, Betsy, you're doing online things. Doug, you're also. So how, what are some of the approaches there in terms of um, engaging people with the, the online classes? Yeah, with the online classes, we communicate with most people through our e-news or our newsletter that comes out um, weekly or bi-weekly just to let people know about all of the different things that we have going on. Each department also has their own email list, so they're able to engage with people who have taken classes in the past before, or people that were previously registered and needed to know about this shift and how we were going to do things. And we're, we have a really uh, large and like prominent social media presence where we're constantly pushing out information on Instagram. Instagram and Facebook and Twitter uh, to let people know. We were also experimenting with doing events live on Instagram versus doing them on Zoom and found that Zoom is the best because we're able to record those and then later upload them to YouTube for people to use. And currently we're experimenting with working with a tech person who is able to have it streaming in all of these different platforms at one time. If you use things like Twitch or open broadcast service, you're able to be live on Facebook um, YouTube and Twitch at the very same time so people can join in anywhere or you can even embed a link directly on your website so people can just go straight there to see the content as well. Um, so those are some of the ways that we've been doing that. And for, I saw a question before about our art making activities. We try to use everyday items that people have at home so people don't have to go out and buy extra supplies and things. We don't want to stress people out. And we really want people to reimagine the everyday things in their houses that they can use for art making activities. Yeah, I want to touch on that as well. Um, you know, I, Alt Space, we work within black and brown communities. And we understand that 30% of neighbors in black and brown communities do not have regular access to internet. And so not only does this provide a problem within education because everyone's doing Zoom, but um, it provides a, pr a problem within communication as well. And so even though we have an online presence, you know, it's important to be there physically. You know what I mean? Like it, it, wear your mask, stay distant, but it's important to be there. You know, it's important to let people know what's going on. It's important to hand out those, those tangibles that, that they can go home with. And at the same time, uh, as Justice Sierra says, being able to have projects like the alt space market that's not made out of precious materials that's super hard to make you know i mean it's it's just a couple boards really you know and some screws and we've been able to see it be replicated in oakland and brooklyn um and inglewood in california you know and and so you know um just being able to be easily accessible for the people and that is an interesting problem you know we when we first hit the pandemic and we're trying to come up with activities we really thought, well, it's kind of like Apollo 11, you know, when you're coming back from the moon and what do you have to make stuff out of? And, and so, you know, can you do a watercolor with, on typing paper with coffee? You sure can, and, and it can be a, a good activity. It, ultimately, it comes down to how you can be creative and being creative is taking advantage of those resources that are available to you. When we did classes, I actually ended up filming them and editing them and posting them on Facebook and YouTube uh, simultaneously, just so people could access them whenever they were available to them, you know, so it wasn't like they had to check in at a certain time. But it really, it really worked out well, we had great response. And, you know, you have to meet people where they live. And, and, you know, John's doing that, a lot of people are doing that. And, and uh, you know, God bless you, because that's, that's the real work. The challenge with some of the online teaching is that it winds up being one direction from the teacher to the students. We, were, we tried for a while to do these critique and show and tell um, things with people who were doing work at home, but um, it's really hard to see what someone is doing between the lighting and the camera on their computer and you know, it's all, it's really wonky. So can you say that the perspective is just right? little hard to tell you know it, it's really it's really hard to properly evaluate work so it does wind up becoming a sort of one directional from the teacher to the student on a technique without a lot of give and take so I would say that that's the hard part of 
of teaching online. Um, I mean, sometimes they can, you know, if, if you're doing it live, they can ask questions, but it's really hard to necessarily see what the student's doing right or wrong or what what's not translating through the camera, you know, to the, you know, to the other side. So the, I, I think there's still a big learning curve on how to teach online, you know, not just for artists, but for everybody. We have a, a, a lot of local artists who, you know, teach art in the schools, you know, who are stuck doing it on Zoom right now, who are really struggling with how you impart this information in an effective way. Yeah, I think that there's this, you know, I've kind of noticed that there's this uh, need that maybe was just sort of hidden before is that uh, is those kinds of questions, you know, to really, you know, maybe there's a workshop on how to present your work online, you know, if you're working with artists or, uh, you know, we've had, I know I te do some teaching through the Chicago Arts Partnerships and Education through Chicago Public Schools. And one of the things that the big problem we had was uh, getting materials to students last year, you know, that the, the, when things first started and people didn't have internet and, you know, so I think that there are these, um, you know, kind of really, you know, we have these sort of aspirational um, ideas and I agree that there's this huge moment of opportunity for us to come up with new ways to do the work we do. But there's also this kind of like nuts and bolts, like how do we do, get it done? <laughs> you know, so, um, and it's those things that I think are really very, um, uh, you know, I, I find it really inspiring because I find a lot of people kind of pulling together and asking questions and trying to connect. Oops. There are a couple of, uh, sorry, <laughs> a couple of questions in the Q&A about organizations interested in partnering with individuals who offer programs in music education and music comp composition. I don't know if anyone has a response to that. Kind of, I don't know if, the, do any of you do music education? Yeah, um, you know, Alt Space, we definitely um, teach about music and putting other people. I think uh, one of the, the key components of our name is Alt Space itself, right? So it comes from the computer, understanding that like Alt Space by itself can't do anything, you know, but with another component, we can do everything. And so um, we're always down for a collaboration, man. I think that's the cool part of this time is being able to be molded and changed. And, you know, I think, I mean, that's, that's the part of community, right? Like the work that all of us do, um, <laughs> it's so funny because I'm thinking about a conversation I had with a partner this morning. Um, but the work that we all do is molded by the community partners, which we have, you know, we try things and some, and some of those things are really impactful, but then some things don't work. And so it's like, okay, we have to recalibrate and ask our, our partners and ask our neighbors, you know, what would benefit you while at the same time keeping that artistic integrity. And so I think that um, I can speak for alt space in the sense of like, yo, hit us up, email us. Like, we'd love to hear from you and hear about your ideas because your ideas and your talents are super valid and needed in this world. Yeah, I would say the same thing. We are always looking to connect no, with go ahead. partners at the Hyde Park Art Center as well. Um, we do work with our teens and, as I mentioned, the Artful Aging um, organization. So I think that any type of engagement that we can do with them around something as awesome as music as well would be something we would be open to. So feel free to hit us up anytime. Great. Well, I see we have one minute left. There are a couple of questions, and I don't know if uh, there's someone asking about holding the gala online. Could you talk more about what that would look like? And then whether any of us have helped to connect artists and art students or families with housing resources or eviction support and that sort of, um, those sorts of related referrals. I haven't had experience with that, but I don't know if anyone else has. Yeah, so for our virtual gala, we've been thinking about artist interventions that we can do or host online, and that can be anywhere from uh, workshops um, showing how to make things, studio visits with different artists or our residents. Um, we've also got 
live auction and a silent auction that we're doing as a part of that. And we're gonna utilize the breakout rooms to have each room have a different theme and people can pop in and experience something different and then kind of jumble around and then go to something else. But we're kind of building all of that out right now. Um, our gala is definitely something that a lot of folks look forward to each year and it's it's really about attending and the people so we're trying to cultivate cultivate that in the virtual realm um, and hopefully it's still a fun party which i have no doubt it will it will be <laughs> thanks and you know so we're at 315 so I, it's time to close this but um there is one uh person who had a question about um uh, sh how to get in touch with us in the, in the future. And I just want to encourage everyone to, uh, our, all of our contact information is on the, uh, 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 the conference website. And uh, you can also contact any of us through our organizations. I put a bunch of um, information in the uh, chat with just like some other organizations that are doing great work and uh, really inspiring work. And thank you everyone for your participation. This has been really great talking with all of you and, and working with you on this. And um, thanks so much. I look forward to more opportunities to work together. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, we need more time next time. Our Art Alliance. We need. We need. We need two hours. That's ten minutes. Got the most gangster and genius people in the city. Say, hey, y'all got five minutes, huh? <laughs> Love y'all. That's right. You too. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.